Hi, my name is Suzanne Schulmeister and I'm one of the two main instructors of the course. If you haven't watched the intro video yet, please pause this video now and see the intro video where Owen and I introduce ourselves and tell you some important things about the MOOC. In this module, we want to explain what biodiversity is, how it can be measured, what different aspects of it you can observe, and what biodiversity science is, which is concerned with all of these topics. In this photo that I took in the German Alps, you can see some biodiversity. Isn't it just gorgeous? But what is biodiversity? The word is short for biological diversity. It is difficult to, to define, and there have been many discussions about it, but basically, it is the variety of life. This can be the variation of all life on the entire planet, or the word can be used to refer to the diversity in one area. For example, the biodiversity in this alpine meadow. Biodiversity includes the diversity at species level, that is between the different species, and also below species level, meaning the diversity within species, be it between individuals or between different populations of a species. For example, in the species with the white flowers you see in the picture, some plants are taller than others. Above species level, biodiversity includes the diversity among ecosystems. In the photo, you can see the ecosystem of an alpine meadow and behind it, the ecosystem of a mixed deciduous forest. Biodiversity extends not only to the morphological and anatomical variation, that is what organisms look like and how they're built, but also to the DNA and other molecules, to the functions the organisms perform, and to the behaviors they exhibit. Biodiversity is often equated with number of species, but this is way too simple, and number of species is better referred to as species richness. In this video, I want to give you a short overview of life on this planet. For the purpose of this video, I'll consider viruses not as alive, and hence will not include them in this discussion. All life that exists today on our planet has evolved from a single ancestor. This ancestral species split up into two species, which then split up into four species, and so forth so that the relationships among the species on Earth can be represented as a branching pattern similar to a tree. That's why we call the evolutionary relationships of life sometimes the tree of life. If you find this diagram a bit confusing, don't worry. In the second module, I will explain how to read evolutionary trees. And in the third module, I'll tell you a bit about the evolution of these major lineages of life. Life on Earth can be divided into two major groups, the prokaryotes and the eukaryotes. These two groups are often referred to as super kingdoms or empires. Prokaryotes are simple organisms without a nucleus and without organelles. Eukaryotes, on the other hand, do have a nucleus and their cells also have organelles, for example, mitochondria. In one popular classification scheme, these two super kingdoms are divided into six kingdoms. Prokaryotes are divided into two, the kingdom eubacteria and the kingdom archaebacteria. The super kingdom eukaryota is divided into four kingdoms. The plants in the kingdom plantae, the animalia, or animals, and the fungi, which contains the mushroom-producing fungi and their relatives like molds and yeasts. All the other eukaryotes that are not part of plantae, animalia, or fungi are together classified as the fourth kingdom, the protoctista, sometimes called protista or protists. The classification of life into the six kingdoms is a poor reflection of the evolutionary relationships in the tree of life. But for the purpose of this video, that is to show you the diversity of life, it works well enough. So now I'm going to give you a brief description of each of the six kingdoms. 
I'll start with the prokaryotes. This is the famous Escherichia coli, which is normally found in our intestines. Nowadays, it can also be found in innumerable petri dishes in laboratories around the world where it is used for countless scientific studies. Bacteria usually come in these three shapes. The rod shape you see on the left, the spiral in the middle, and the sphere. However, members of the group cyanobacteria look more like algae and are capable of photosynthesis. Hence its misleading common name, blue-green algae. When they become too abundant in the water, for example if there's too many nutrients, they show up as so-called algal blooms. Many other organisms can also form algal blooms, algae for example, big surprise, but most of the toxic algal blooms are actually caused by cyanobacteria. The small photo shows an algal bloom of cyanobacteria in Lake Erie. The second kingdom of prokaryotes are the archaebacteria. They look very much like eubacteria, but they are very different in terms of their molecular makeup and chemical pathways. Many of them are found in extreme environments like hot springs, and it had been thought that all of them are such extremophiles. However, it has recently been found that they also occur in more normal environments, like inside and outside the human body. In terms of the number of individuals, prokaryotes are far more abundant than eukaryotes. And in terms of biomass, prokaryotes might equal plants or even plants and animals together. In other words, if you weigh all the eubacteria and archaebacteria on this planet, you would find that they weigh as much as all the plants and animals taken together. Isn't that amazing? While eukaryotes are morphologically more diverse, prokaryotes exhibit a greater metabolic diversity. For example, some of them are capable of using ph photosynthesis, like plants. Others can metabolize organic molecules the way, plants, uh, the way animals and fungi can. And yet other bacteria are able to live on anorganic molecules like hydrogen sulfide and methane. Prokaryotes play important roles in ecosystems, for example as decomposers of dead organic matter, be it inside the soil or inside the digestive tracts of animals. Some bacteria, called rhizobia, are capable of fixing nitrogen and live in mutualistic relationships with a certain group of plants, the legumes. The plants form root nodules in which the rhizobia live. In the next video, I'll show you the eukaryotes. See you there!